Thank you, Alon, for having time. I'm uh, very happy that we can meet today and um, uh, hear a little bit about your life and your wisdom. Well, it's a it's a, an honor to be asked and a pleasure to be here. I'm a, um, I'm, I'm a little dingy today because I got my second vaccine shot yesterday. Oh, hmm, yeah. So I, I'm feeling a little... I see. Yeah. I, I'm not at 100%, but I'm... I'm never at a hundred percent. So, <laughs> welcome to the club. <laughs> so, what what kind of vaccine did you get? Pfizer. Pfizer. Okay. Okay. I will see. At the moment, we don't have that much uh, of a choice here in Germany. You know. Well, I I think uh, anything you can you can get first is what you should be getting. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I, I, I think about that. I already had COVID-19 about uh, December 29. Oh. And it, it was, at that time, nobody knew what it was, but I had all the symptoms, everything. And uh, it, it was quite a ride, I can tell you. Oh, well, I'm glad you made it through it. So you probably have a bit of your own uh, resistance to it, uh, or at least that strain, yes. So, well, so. glad. Glad to, glad to hear you made it through okay. Yes, I did. Uh, Alon, when I, when I read your biography and, and uh, some of uh, your books, I um, had the um, impression that you have a special, a very special gift explaining magic, tarot, these kind of things to people, you know, like me who don't have this special knowledge so we can understand what it's all about. And so I canceled um, most of the questions I had and uh, wanted just to ask you whether you would do us a favor to talk a little bit about what is magic for the rest of us. So why do you do it? Why is it so such a core topic of your life? You know, I think that might be very interesting. Well, yeah, you know, I'm a, I'm a musician too, or, or I wouldn't say that I'm a musician, but, but uh, uh, I write songs and uh, over the years in uh, various capacities, you know, I get them recorded and, and played and things like that. So if that makes me a musician, then I guess I'm a musician. Uh, and that's... Uh, but that's not what I am, okay? And that's not what you are. You are what you do or, or even what you study or, or okay? Uh, you're just who you are. And uh, uh, part of who I am uh, was best served uh, in my youth uh, by learning to play guitar and uh, 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 expressing myself that way, but but I went at it sort of from a from a, uh, an activist's point of view. Uh, I I don't like to write songs that are just about nothing. Okay, uh, when I was a kid, I all my songs had to uh, have some kind of social social message or, or uh, my heroes were uh, like Woody Guthrie and mm. uh, Pete Seeger and then, mm. uh, then Bob Dylan and so, I, I just love those old 1930s depression era progressive uh, you know labor movement folk songs you know yeah yeah okay and uh, when I was growing up, it was the Vietnam War. Oh yeah, terrible. That, that was the uh, the background meditation to a whole generation of, of yeah. uh, kids that I I grew up uh, with, and it was a uh, uh, you know I'm not the smartest guy in the world. I don't I I don't even know what my IQ is. It's not fair. I'm just a regular guy, uh, and I probably have attention deficit disorder or something like that because 
Uh, I was terrible in school. I mean, mm -hmm. horrible. And uh, but things that I loved in school, I just I just poured everything into it, you know. But but I was uh, I was a class clown. Mm -hmm. And it, it wasn't until you know that I that they discovered that I'd fit in with music and theater <laughs> that, <laughs> that they said, well, well, maybe we won't have to kick him out too many times if we get him in in uh, music and theater. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I I'm just who uh, uh, who I am. I'm an observer of myself. And, and I don't know if that is a, uh, a key or not, mm -hmm. because one of the great epiphanies of uh, esoteric study is the realization that, that the very first thing, the very first step on the road of return or the the first awakening is that you become the observer of your own existence. Mm -hmm. And for some reason, uh, I had, uh, well, I had a, a bone disease in my hip when I, uh, just yeah. when I started to walk. Mm -hmm. And uh, they thought it was polio, of course, in those years, they thought it was polio. And, and uh, but it wasn't. It was this bone disease that uh, called Perthes, and there's no cure to it. But you, uh, uh, every once in a while, the patient will outgrow it if you just immobilize them. Oh, okay. So I was immobilized from about well three to almost five years old. It was, it was two years I was immobilized. Oh God! Just, just laying in my crib. They put me back mm -hmm. in the crib, you know, mm -hmm. and I just stared at the ceiling and I was still, I was still so young. I was processing the infantile yeah. memories, which aren't connected to language. I see. Okay. <laughs> and, and so the, the idea of the continuity of my own existence mm -hmm. and that I was being an observer of my own existence uh, you know, physicists say that uh, uh, you you change the the circumstances of an experiment just by observing it. Yes. Okay. Physics, yes. So 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 what what greater piece of magic is when you observe yourself? Okay. Oh. And so this is where I would I. Uh, uh, received or enjoyed replaying my pre-linguistic infant memories mm -hmm. and that included what i can only interpret now as glimpses of previous incarnations mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and uh, uh but i wasn't looking at it in a linear way mm -hmm. like i have just okay uh, everything was compressed into a now. <laughs> yeah, yeah, okay. Yeah. And so it wasn't like, oh, I went back in time and remembered a previous incarnation. No, no, this is just me as a soldier. You know, oh. this is just me as a, you know, a, a, a clerk, <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. and uh, I didn't uh, uh, think anything spooky ab about that at all but I became the observer of my own existence. Mm -hmm. and, and by the time I uh, uh, got out and could start walking and things like that, and I uh, got to go to movies, uh, I love the fact that movies were a form of this self-observation only the audience was the observer okay oh, okay yeah so so 
every day when I'd walk to school and things like that, when I got uh, quite a bit older, I'd walk to school and I could play in my head uh, music that I loved. Mm -hmm. And it would be like the soundtrack <laughs> of my own movie. Wow. Okay. Mm -hmm. So that's where truly the magic started. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. that I realized that as a consciousness, as a unit of consciousness, I observe my own existence. That must mean I can, I can work with the plot of my own movie. Okay, yeah. So instead of just being the observer, I'm also the director. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I'm also the protagonist <laughs> and villain, okay, because they're always more interesting, you know. So I, I guess the whole thing just sort of started like that. So that applied to absolutely everything that I did in my in my day to day life. That's how I handled school. That's how I handled piano lessons. That's how I handled the. Uh, uh, being in the, the school musicals, uh, mm -hmm. once I got a, a guitar, uh, that's how I got into a band. <laughs> that's <laughs> and uh, and all of it was my magic. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So when uh, when I moved to California uh, after graduating from high school, my music almost. Immediately, I mean, within just a couple months, mm -hmm. uh, I was writing songs with uh, with my partner, and we were we were getting the songs published. Mm -hmm. uh, by 1969, uh, we had a recording contract with with Epic Records. Made uh, wow. made uh, uh, an album, two singles with Epic. Uh, did studio work. I mean, it just it wasn't like I had a desire to do that. <laughs> <laughs> it just happened. It just happened because it seemed like it was easier to do it than to not do it. I see. Mm -hmm. It's almost like the, uh, uh, each of us have a have a have a flow mm -hmm. uh, about our our life while why we're here. We wouldn't even be here. We wouldn't even be conscious. We wouldn't even uh, uh, be a monad of consciousness if there wasn't something that we had to do. <laughs> okay, we wouldn't even be here if if you're here right now. That means there's a job that you got to do that's undone. <laughs> you know? You're here. Well, get to work. You know, you're. Great idea. Yeah. <laughs> Great idea. Yeah. It's all, all your songs I listen to on on YouTube, they are fantastic. You know, the text, the lyrics, they really, they really were catchy for me. Very, very interesting. Very thoughtful. Very wise and and very entertaining. Like, uh, don't write me off. You know, uh, I think uh, that everybody who gets at the end of fifty or so should hear it. It well, is I agree. Yeah. <laughs> the message. It's the message, you know. But all the other songs I listened to, I did not listen to everything, but I listened to about a seven, eight. They were all like wise. And I thought, does this come from your magic? Because one sentence which, uh, which I remembered is that you stated the only thing which you can really change by doing magic is yourself. Wow, that's interesting. Well, well of course. Uh, because yourself is all you have to work with. <laughs> yes, right. <laughs> uh, you know, the uh, the big misconception mm -hmm. about magic is that uh, it's sort of a Hollywood way of looking at it, that uh, you, you do magic to tap into uh, uh, objective hidden forces that... Uh, that uh, you know represented as angels and demons and th things mm -hmm. like that, and then by some kind of uh, uh, 
variety of bullying you you bully some demons in or, or, or angels you bully them into doing stuff for you and then then they get mad at you and then eat you or take you to hell or something Gosh. like that hmm. uh, but that's that's not the way it works okay uh, it may appear for a while to be something like that and of course the medieval magicians uh, yeah. cer certainly uh, uh, interpreted the technical aspects of, of how all of this works uh, but they really missed the big point okay yeah uh, yeah I think it was a little bit Machiavellian style which they understood what magic is right mm -hmm. and um, the, the thing is that yes you can affect a change in the world around you you can do magic to affect a change in the world around you mm. uh, but in order to affect that change the magician has to the reason the magician needs that change to happen is because mm. at the moment the magician just isn't the type of person that that stuff happens to. Uh, well, yeah. Okay. Quite an, quite an idea. It'd be like, like, okay, you know, I want to win the lottery. Mm -hmm. Okay, I want to win the lottery. I want to whip up a demon and make him make me win that lottery. Theoretically, you don't have that lottery money because mm -hmm. you're not the type of guy at the moment who wins the lottery. <laughs> mm -hmm. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Because there are people who win the lottery. You know, yes. it, it's not a big miracle. Mm -hmm. There's lots of lottery winners. You're just not the type of guy that can mm -hmm. win the lottery if you're going to do magic and you've only got yourself truly to work with, how do I change myself into the type of guy that wins the lottery? I see. And that's where all of the crazy, scary stuff happens. Mm -hmm. Because if it really is your will to win that lottery, if that's really part of your big, uh, you know, karmic uh, momentum there, then you're going to have to knock some rough edges off yourself yeah. to turn you into that type of person that wins the lottery. Mm -hmm. And in your particular case, I'm not meaning you personally, I'm just no, I understand. in your particular case, in order to make you into the type of person that wins the lottery, you have to be, let's say you have to lose your leg. Gosh. Mm unpleasant uh, i'm just saying this as a i see i see but it turns you into a different kind of person yes okay uh, everything changes your consciousness changes the way people around you ch uh, change and the way people uh, around you and the way the world reacts to you becomes so different that you are so different that just perhaps that turns you into the type of person mm -hmm. that wins the lottery Mm -hmm. An easier uh, analogy would be you do magic to make the girl next door to fall in love with you. <laughs> yeah, I see. Okay, but she's her own magician. Mm -hmm. You can't work on her. Mm -hmm. No matter what you think, mm -hmm. you can't. <laughs> she's her own magician. You can't go there. So you the reason she's not in love with you is you're not the type of person that she would ever, ever, ever fall in love with. Okay. So you do magic, you whip up the spirit, he says, Yeah, I can get her to fall in love with you. And then for the next six months, that spirit or your life conspires to put you through so many traumatic changes. Mm -hmm that it appears that they are misfortunes. <laughs> I see. 
Okay, so this is where the bad reputation for this kind of magic comes. Oh, I did this and I had such terrible luck. And, you know, and, oh, I did this and my dog got killed and I did this, you know. Mm -hmm. But let's just say that the girl next door would fall in love with you mm -hmm. if, if she noticed you. And she wouldn't notice you unless you, say, lost your leg. <laughs> Yeah, I, I see. And then not only that, but then she starts to help you get to the grocery store a couple of days a week. You start talking with her. She starts falling in love with you, you know, and that would, and if it was truly your will that you get together with that gal, the whole thing was worth it. Mm -hmm, okay. Mm -hmm. And if it wasn't your will, Mm. the the spirit still succeeded in doing what it said it would do yes yes it was what you wanted yeah mm -hmm. and in a sense that's that's how all of that kind of practical magic works it only works on yourself mm -hmm. so the the big uh revelation in that kind of magic is First of all, what do you want? Mm -hmm. In order to be a, make your magic work and to do magic and to be a magician, what do you want? That, that is an interesting point. You see, whenever I was um, reading this sentence, love is the law, love under will, what many people I know understood as will is like the will of the ego. But I got so many hints in the text that it's more the will of the six chakras. So the spiritual will, what, what is your opinion on that? Well, that's absolutely, absolutely correct. Um, you know, for the last couple thousand years, uh, the, the West has been dominated by the, the idea of uh, uh, the will of God and yeah. God's will, and that that uh, uh, good, pious people uh, do their best to cooperate with God's will. You know, mm -hmm. I just want many prayers. I just want to do your will, you know, mm -hmm. your will for my life, you know, let me do it, you know, and all of that's, that, that's fine and good. And it's a, mm -hmm. uh, it's an advance from a more primitive uh, point of view. It's, it's a spiritual advance to look at things that way. Would this be in Taro at the Great Arcana, the High Priestess? Well, she, she's a she's a, a, a facet of that, uh, the, especially the one that, that's uh, concerned with the, the memory flow that mm -hmm. uh, is necessary. But the, the idea that we are already born and we wouldn't be here if mm -hmm. we weren't already part of what we always thought was God's will. Yeah. Okay. We're here. Okay. It's a foregone conclusion. It's obvious. It's self-evident. I'm here. I'm part of what, what they used to call God's will. Mm -hmm. But it's so stupid to try to figure out the, the details of what the omniscient, omnipresent, omna everything else is uh, singular intelligence, singular consciousness of the universe, to try to figure that out and then attempt to cooperate with it. Okay. <laughs> That's so stupid. When you're already here, it's already it's already infused you. Let me just figure out what my will is, and then I will understand what God's will <laughs> is. Okay, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and I can understand it from the the point of view, from the facet that I am here to perceive it. Mm -hmm. So that's the. That's the love is the law, okay, the mm -hmm. love, love under will. And the fact that, that uh, 
discovering and doing one's will is just a new kind of improved way of looking at, I want to do God's will. Mm -hmm. I see. Mm -hmm. Does that make yeah. sense? Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Uh, by the way, when, when reading the Guishia, I don't know how you pronounce it right, Guishia. You could pronounce it any way you want. <laughs> <laughs> when, when reading this and reading your, your biography, I had the impression that the, the demons, the angels, they have a gender problem because there were always male people over there. Don't they have girls over there? Obviously not. Okay. Okay. <laughs> no. <laughs> That's a great observation, too. And you notice in the. Uh, the Goetia, I pronounce it Goetia, okay? okay? And it's probably incorrect. So, but I've done it for so many years. Uh, it's, uh, you know, spelled Goetia. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, but it's a unique word in and of itself. Uh, but, but there are 72 spirits that... Uh, are, are, are roughly assigned to the, uh, in pairs to the decans of the, the zodiac, okay? Mm -hmm. uh, the 36 decans, there's a, uh, a Goetia spirit for the daytime and one for the nighttime, okay? Oh, wow, very structured. Well, and you know, it just, uh, it was just one magician that organized them that <laughs> way, too. you know? It, it wasn't like, <clears throat> you know, Metatron, you know, set up the chart himself, you know, or anything like that. Uh, but uh, they all seem to be male. Mm -hmm. Even the ones that are assigned to the, uh, the metal, copper, and the planet Venus, mm -hmm. And even though they've got names like Ashtaroth, which sounds suspiciously like Astarte, mm -hmm. and even though it's obvious that quite a number of them appear as a beautiful woman or as a beautiful angel. Oh. Or as a as a good looking angel, or or you know, and then you got to remember that we wouldn't even have these manuscripts had it not been for the work of monks who copied these manuscripts from older manuscripts. Oh, and in that process of lonely, lonely, sexually frustrated, <laughs> uh, anxiety-ridden monks, scribes over the years, things like Astarte, former gods of the previous aeon. You know, the gods of one aeon become the devils of the aeon yeah, to follow. Yeah, okay. yeah. And so that's how these, these uh, the characters of these spirits got pigeonholed into number one, being all male, mm -hmm. then being all, all unpleasant, you know? Yeah. Okay. Because all they were trying to do is personify 72 sections of our own psyche that actually do the heavy lifting in our life. Mm -hmm. okay. uh, they're, they're blind forces when they're not directed or controlled. Mm -hmm. So there's, you know, it's a, did, do you like Star Trek? Do you like the old Star Trek? Uh, sure, sure, come on. <laughs> There was there was a there was an old Star Trek uh, where Captain Kirk somehow got himself split up into two Captain Kirks. Mm -hmm. One was completely positive and aggressive, mm -hmm. 
and the other one was completely passive mm -hmm. and uh, and and negative okay uh, mm -hmm. I, negative in a good way but depressive mild okay mm -hmm. and the the positive side was ambitious and greedy and driven and <laughs> egoy in every and the other one just couldn't make a decision because he could see he could see everything. He was totally empathetic and stuff. Okay. Neither one of them could get the job done of being the captain. Okay. Yeah. So the Goetian spirits are 72 individual little units of all the things that can get stuff done, but they've mm -hmm. got to have a higher intelligence to direct them sort of like the heavy machinery at a construction site, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. okay? Uh, that, that big bulldozer is, could be so destructive mm -hmm. if you just turn on the switch and put it in gear and then jump off and let that bulldozer go all around the town. It would smash buildings and run over people and everything else. Mm -hmm, It'd be mm -hmm. very destructive. Mm -hmm. But when there's an intelligence, sitting in the driver's seat of that bulldozer, you can help construct great buildings with it. You could build a temple with it. You could build a church with it, okay? And that's what Goetia is. Inside each of us yeah. are all of these units of blind forces. Some of them we've already got under control. Otherwise, we... we uh, we're, we're not in jail or, we're, you know, we're, we're, we're not beating people up. So we got a few of those under, under control, mm -hmm. but some of them are still giving us a real problem and are just sort of running amok mm -hmm. in our, uh, uh, in our psyches. And it's, the, and it's those mm -hmm. that we try to get under control to fix specific things in our life yeah i tell people never please you know it's no good to even dream about evoking a goetic spirit unless you've got a problem mm -hmm. okay if you've got a problem your problem is that spirit oh so it's a problem and a solution it's the it's a solution because only the problem can fix itself. I see. So, mm -hmm. so once you've identified the, and just think about it, how many times have you even pretended mm -hmm. that you've trapped your problem in a triangle and had the opportunity oh, yeah. to have a heart to heart talk with, <laughs> with that? with that problem you know? times. yeah that's what it is it's a it's an exercise like that and once you've had that talk with it once the spirit has made its agreement with you mm -hmm. to shape up then you have to hold it to its promise mm -hmm. and that's where the work starts being done on yourself and that mm -hmm. does manifest in weird unseen ways in the circumstances of your life around you so much so that that uh, it would lead one to uh, draw all sorts of superstitious conclusions mm -hmm. i see but it, it's you really shouldn't it's things that just take place on a quantum level you know that's what they'd say now you know that, that sounds in many ways um, like a more detailed way, like in Huna, there is the Unili, Unihipili, we call it often inner child, which represents all these powers, but it needs the Almakua, the higher self, to, to do some good stuff, some constructive stuff. Is, is this a similar concept? It's the exact same concept. Mm -hmm. It's the exact same, only with, with medieval clothes on. Yeah, and more detailed, of course. Yeah, yeah. 
and related to astrology, as I have just learned from you. So that is fascinating. There is astrology with angels built in. Right. Uh, yeah, a deck of tarot cards is, uh, is like a block of flats. <laughs> it's, really? It's a, it's, a, it's a spirit, angel spirit block of flats. And Gosh. Yeah. Your idea, what you, what you uh, wrote in your biography, that the first, I think, years when you were dealing, uh, learning to, to, uh, to use the tarot, you understood the tarot not as something like an oracle, but as something to promote your growth of your personality. That is fascinating. Most people do it for oracle purposes. Well, that's, uh, and it makes a good oracle because yeah. it's perfect. Mm -hmm. Okay, it's a, you know, just like a, a, a beautiful astrological wheel with the decans and, the, and the, the houses and the signs and the planets. Okay, it's, it's perfect. Okay, mm -hmm. and beauty and uh, perfect things, uh, that's where truth reveals itself. That's mm -hmm. why when we take a walk in a, at a beautiful, out the beach or something, and the perfection of the beauty around us kicks off all sorts of, uh, it speaks truth. Mm -hmm. So in, in beauty is eternal truth revealed. And uh, uh, yeah, I got into tarot uh, to as sort of a, a shortcut, bonehead way for me to, to uh, grasp Kabbalistic uh, principles. Oh. Uh, and um, as a matter of fact, I, I, my whole publishing, I, uh, look, I'm lazy, okay? Mm -hmm. I never intended to be a writer, okay? <laughs> I'd be happy just playing songs and picking my guitar and, you know. Uh, uh, but I sort of accidentally fell into uh, uh, writing mm -hmm. uh, because, I created a, a, a tarot deck, not, a, not an official tarot deck, just something I could use uh, for my Monday night magic class, mm -hmm. sort of as flashcards. And uh, the idea being that, uh, like here's like the five of wands, okay? Oh, I see, beautiful. Okay. Oh, with the with the Enochian uh, uh, symbol in it. Yeah, because everything fits with everything else. <laughs> wow, wow. Everything is self-referential or is, is co-referential. Okay, but uh, the four of wands here is uh, 20 degrees to 30 degrees Aries. Great. You see? Yeah. See that in the corner? Okay. Uh, don't you have a tarot deck in print? I tried to get it in Germany, but they don't seem to have it in stock. Uh, it's hard. To, it's hard to get because of the shipping at the at the, at the moment. Uh, but it's uh, tarot of ceremonial magic. Great, and and there you have also these astrological Enochian details in it. Yes. So wow. first, first of all, there and there's the date. You know, it's April or okay, and. There's, I gotta do this like that. Okay. Yeah, no, I can there, see it. No, I can there's see it. one Goetian spirit that goes mm -hmm. in it. That's the nighttime one, and yep. it's the daytime one. Ah, oh, I see. Mm -hmm. And there's in five degree sections, those are classic Kabbalistic angels of that five degree period. Ah. Those are called angels of the Shemhamferish. Okay. Mm -hmm. Now, each of the small cards, the twos through tens, represent 30 degrees of the zone, or 10 degrees. So the 36 small cards are the whole zodiacal year in decades. Ah, and the Goetic spirits, right? And the Goetic spirits, angels of the Shemhamferish, and even the Enochian square off of the... the uh, grand cross of all four of the elemental tablets of the Enochian system. What a treasure chamber. Did you write a book about that? Yes. Ah, 
please let me know what it is. <laughs> the book is called Terror of Ceremonial Magic, and it's much easier to get at the moment than uh, uh, e the cards are, and much cheaper. It's yeah. it's in uh, uh, it's sold internationally all over the place. Mm -hmm. But the court cards, the knights, the queens, and the princes, and rule, the rule twenty degrees of one sign to twenty degrees of another. Ah, that's genial. And they even have Yi Ching hexagrams Good. associated with them because uh, the Knight of Wands here is Fire of Fire. So that's mm -hmm. the Fire of Fire Yi Ching hexagram. Mm -hmm. And there's the Enochian sub angle. Wow. And the Tatva symbols uh, are on the card so that you can actually use the card uh, with the Tatva meditation to actually astrally project into uh, that quadrant of the elemental universe that the Knight of Discs represents. Just help us a little bit with the Tatva. I think many people would like to know more about what Tatva is. The uh, Hindus mm -hmm. uh, have their version of uh, uh, the elemental work, or I should say that the Western magic has its version of the Hindu, <laughs> because the, the, the Hindu came long before oh, uh, yeah. oh, the yeah. medieval times. So the, the idea that uh, uh, we can talk about wands and cups and swords and discs, uh, being uh, weapons of the uh, fire, water, air, and earth. Mm -hmm. okay. So they're symbols for fire, mm -hmm. water, air, and earth. Uh, and, uh, and that means everything in the cosmos that's either fiery in nature mm -hmm. or watery in nature. It doesn't have to be wet to be watery. A mirror mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They can, be, uh, can be a water symbol, you know. Sure. Um, but the Hindus, uh, like so much other in the science of, of esoteric thought, they really had their act together. And instead of wading our way through symbols like a, like a wand for fire, they said, no, we can just get the essence of mm -hmm. what that is, the essence mm -hmm. of that facet of the totality mm -hmm. of consciousness of that we would call fire. Mm -hmm. And we can just get that, not by reading the Vedas or not by reading a text or not by uh, hearing a sound or it, but we can get that information just through the cones and rods of our eyes. Mm -hmm. And the perfect symbol for fire, what we would call fire, is a red triangle with the apex pointing up. OK. And if you look, uh, if you look at that red triangle, I'm trying to find. If you look at that red triangle under a nice bright light, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and just sort of relax mm -hmm. and do whatever you need to do to sort of say, I now want to go into that world that mm -hmm. is pure fire so I can understand its nature and what it means to me. And then all of a sudden, just take your eyes off of that and look mm -hmm. at, a, at a white surface, say. Mm -hmm. And you see that ghost image. Yeah, yeah. And that ghost image is sort of blue. <laughs> so. <laughs> because 
that red isn't really red, it's everything but red, okay? So in order for us to actually see what the red is, we have to trap that ghost image and then project into it mm -hmm. to see what that world of that facet of consciousness is really like. And that's where we have our own private mm -hmm. uh, visions. Uh, and, and the message is, is delivered to us in our own vocabulary of mm -hmm. images and our own vocabulary of concepts that means something to us and us alone. So uh, like one magician might project into that, uh, this fire of fire symbol, mm -hmm. and they, they might see something very classic, you know, uh, uh, you know, a, a, a fiery, a fiery dragon of some kind, or, or mm -hmm. something like that. And someone else might get the vision of a of themselves eating a red popsicle, or <laughs> or, or so. Okay, <laughs> the me the message would be absolutely the same, mm -hmm. but it was delivered in a vocabulary that is yeah. understandable only to the magician. Mm -hmm. This is why I don't particularly like guided meditations. Oh, I see. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. I don't, you know, you, oh, you climb up into the, the tree of life and you enter the, the yellow world of Hode and mm -hmm. you, you see a man in an orange, orange vest eating fish sticks with his toes or, uh, you know, no, don't tell me what to see, you know, <laughs> I'll see my own stupid stuff because it'll mean something to me. Yeah. Uh, just, um, I think one thing which many people ask themselves, why should a magician go into that fire world? What it is not an act of curiosity, I guess. There is something in it when a magician goes into the world of fire or water or earth or air. What is it? What, what do you get out there when working as a magician there? Uh, it's an initiation. Oh. The, uh, and that's what the Kabbalah is good for. It helps organize your, uh, your mind to, get, to give you at least even an artificial idea of the structure of your own consciousness and each step being just a little higher frequency of consciousness mm -hmm. and when you are self-identifying with those those different levels of consciousness you change everything about you changes your perception changes it's hard to know when you've changed <laughs> <laughs> because you because you take yourself with you you know yeah that's yeah. a problem nothing to compare it to no. <laughs> oh, i might change i guess i am you know uh, so it's like an initiation uh mm -hmm. i i love mozart's magic flute okay yeah i just absolutely love it it's it, it's almost like a vaudeville a great metaphor it is yeah. for me And at the very end, uh, uh, Tamino and Pamina, uh, the prince and the princess, together become joint initiates, and they pass through uh, the four elemental universe, uh, mm -hmm. elemental uh, degrees. Mm -hmm. Okay, a and go into the into the level of consciousness where they are truly wed okay, oh okay so is it do i understand this right that the initiation is for getting a kind of integrated personality absolutely so that anima and animus are coming together yeah and the, the thing is we're already there ah we're, we're already integrated okay mm -hmm. Uh, it's just that we're asleep to that fact. <laughs> <laughs> That's interesting. <laughs> yeah. So it's 
it's it's not that we become integrated. We just wake up. Uh, sometimes gradually, sometimes uh, you know more abruptly. Mm. We wake up to the fact that oh, I've been integrated all along. <laughs> <laughs> Gosh, all the work for nothing. <laughs> well, in retrospect, you look at it and you say, yeah. You know, oh, that was a waste of time. Well, it wasn't a waste of time because you probably wouldn't be there had you not done all that stuff, you know, so. When when looking at this triangle, which you showed me, the Tatwa Triangle, I was reminded of the Sri Yantra, you know, this ancient uh, mandala with the triangles. Is there any correlation to that? Any yeah, relation? I, I think that's where the, the, the Tatwa uh, thing was was plucked from. Uh, oh. Air is a blue circle. Yeah. And uh, uh, earth is a yellow square. Mm -hmm. And water is a silver crescent. Like the moon. Right. Mm -hmm. And uh, spirit, the fifth element, mm -hmm. which would be like the aces, Mm -hmm. uh, is represented by a very dark, uh, so violet it looks black, uh, egg. Mm -hmm. And if I can find an ace here, I'll, I'll show you what I mean by that. Let's see. These cards, I, I just made them out of uh, uh, note cards, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. you know, like index cards. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, for Monday night magic class. <laughs> they are great. As soon as, as the ships are, are moving again, I will get my deck. You should. All right. Okay, so there's the ace, ace mm -hmm. of cups. Okay, like the Holy Grail. Yeah, yeah. There's the silver crescent, okay, the water, and there's the black egg, yeah, for spirit, yeah. So, uh, that's how that goes, and that's the that's Enochian stuff there. And Talking about the the, the chalice and um, the, the cups, the holy grail. What I always wondered about is why is the water element related to the Holy Grail? Or is it just a misconception I have? Well, the, uh, the water part of it is, is uh, such a small uh, part of, of its, uh, uh, its meaning as to uh, uh, it, it shouldn't shouldn't dominate the the, the, oh, okay. the thing, uh, but a, a cup receives things, mm -hmm. okay, mm -hmm. and holds it. Not mm -hmm. only that, but then the cup is also given to some to to somebody, okay. Yes, and. Uh, the the idea of uh, the supernal deities, uh, the 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 supreme male and female aspect of deity, uh, aren't really two things mm -hmm. because they belong together. Uh, like yin and yang. Yeah, exactly, mm -hmm. they belong together. Shiva Shakti mm -hmm. uh, on the tree of life. That's Pokemon. Oh, beautiful. And, wow. And Bina. Okay. But they're above the abyss. They're part of that, that three. Mm -hmm. Okay. So that two really isn't real in and of itself. It's just a reflection of one. Oh, I see. And mm -hmm. this three isn't really a thing in, in and of itself. Mm -hmm. It's the realization that one isn't two. <laughs> okay, well, yeah. So nice there's number one, <clears throat> the singularity of consciousness, 
just brooding happily away being the singularity of consciousness mm -hmm. wanting to know what the hell it is why it would want to become self-aware we don't know nobody knows no <laughs> okay you can't. you can't know that why did the singularity want to become self-aware maybe it didn't maybe we're just reading all of this into it <laughs> well you, you need to have something to spend the time you know yeah. but as it appears that we've got lots of stuff around us and that we're not actually the singularity ourselves there must be something to it one wanted to become self-aware and the only way it could do that is to reflect itself inwardly okay Makes sense. It, couldn't, it couldn't hold a mirror outside of itself because there no. is no outside of itself. Okay, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. so it reflected itself like a good yogi in meditation. Okay, mm -hmm. uh, and its dead center of its limitlessness, and goes, "Ah, oh, that's what I am. I'm, I'm the one. Whoa, I'm really big." Or <laughs> I, I'm really... great surprise. Okay. But the second it realized what it was, it created the third condition. Yeah. Okay. And it created that number three. Mm -hmm. And so the second condition would be Shiva. Mm -hmm. The third condition would be Shakti. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, the evolving conscious and, oh and that thing flips and it, yeah, and it becomes uh four five and six and mm -hmm, then that mm -hmm. duplicates just like three did and that becomes mm -hmm. uh seven eight and nine okay mm -hmm. and down here at three we just dangle like a like sort of a dingleberry of uh yeah. afterthought of creation but the awakening of everything below one two and three the awakening of consciousness is seen metaphorically as the blood of the saints mm -hmm. in in uh western allegorical uh, imagery mm -hmm. so it's it's like uh, like the blood the lifeblood of all consciousness that has been overcome in its initiatory rise up up the the tree of life okay until finally it is delivered across that great abyss from four to three mm -hmm. or mm -hmm. even from five to three mm -hmm. and that return to godhead mm -hmm. is seen as the blood of the saints or the blood of the martyrs being poured into the cup of the holy grail ah okay that's the holy blood that's in the the cup yeah and that's number three mm -hmm. so shakti if we're going to I use it right yeah. so shakti holds she's the queen of the the holy grail mm -hmm. and then she tipped up tiptoes across oh. this path of love here which is mm -hmm. to number two mm -hmm. and wakes up shiva yes he's sleeping and gives him a drink <laughs> of the blood of the, the return blood of all evolving life mm -hmm. and that's enough to wake him up and take a look at her and go wow you're pretty tonight <laughs> 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 wow and that when he awakens to that mm -hmm. because of that blood mm -hmm. that she brought across the the thing they unite and become one. So that's the Hiros Gamos idea. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, now the, this has always been implied in mm -hmm. Christian mysticism. 
Yeah. Okay. It's always been implied in Christian mysticism, but it's, uh, uh, and the mystics uh, who attempted to use this figurative language and everything else didn't need to dwell on it because when your consciousness hits that point, all of this becomes self-evident. So, sure. yeah. So this is, this is why we, this is why you got Buddhist stuff that says the same stuff. You got Hindu stuff that says the same thing. Yeah, yeah, Polynesian stuff that says the mm -hmm, same thing. Mm -hmm. Okay, it's not because they all got together and said, "Let's all, <laughs> let's all study the same books." No, <laughs> let's study ourselves, and we all yeah. come to the same conclusion. So, and you find the same thing. That is that is fascinating. Uh, this these three pillars they remind me of Ida Sushumna and Pingala the it's related to that it is that it is that and it is what, that. what is Darth then what is this Darth I don't know how you call it Zephira Zephira yeah. Darth uh, Darth. it's a <laughs> this is my tarot bag and I, I see I, I see it's a, it's a, useful it's the fastest tree of life Okay, notice there isn't a sephira right there in the, in right. the abyss, okay? That's the looking glass area that separates the, the ideal from the actual, I guess we could mm -hmm. look at it that way. Mm -hmm. And there is uh, a kind of an invisible, some say a false sephira or emanation right there, right in the looking glass itself. Mm -hmm. So uh, if reality, or the ideal or the supernal triad would be what you see on the other side of a mirror. Mm -hmm. Da'ath is the mirror surface itself. Ah. And that may, that's the reason that human consciousness has such a challenge to pass from one side of the mirror to the other. Yeah, sure. Okay. And so that is Doth or Daath, D A A T H. It's usually spelled in English. Yeah. And the uh, uh, and it means knowledge. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, from where we're sitting, knowledge is a good thing. Okay. <laughs> from down here, knowledge is whoa. It's really great, and knowledge is good when you're at this level of consciousness and knowledge is great when you're there and knowledge is great. And then here at number six, mm -hmm. okay, <clears throat> you meet your own holy guardian angel. You meet your own private version of deity and, and become married to it, wed to it. Mm -hmm. Okay, you really wake up pretty good right there. Is this the Ishta deity? which they venerate in India, the personal deity? Yeah, yeah. Oh. And, and uh, uh, until, uh, until you, you get your personal thing, uh, devotion to any deity will, will uh, uh, activate the, the, uh, the anahata. Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it's, it's a trigger. It, it uh, uh, you fall so in love with deity uh, that not only are you finally able to love deity, send out a, a love ray to deity, mm -hmm. but you've also got to the point of where you can completely surrender and receive that same ray of love back from the deity. Oh, okay. And it creates a, a, a feedback, just like yeah. when you put a microphone in front of a speaker, it goes, ee, you know? Oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, I know that. But this is a love feedback. Okay, and it's a better and one. When it happens, of course, you catch on fire, you know? Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay, but that's where that marriage happens. But mm -hmm. when you get all the way to four there, there's mm -hmm. only really one place for you to go, and that's through the looking glass. Ah, oh, that's what it's for. Uh, I, when I read your book, uh, you quoted Crowley saying that everything which 
every magical act which does not help you to unite with your guardian angel is considered to be black magic and only acceptable until you get there. Yeah. Is, this, is this the idea of which you just yeah. explained to us? Yeah. Uh, oh. The it's like two crises. Okay, you can mm -hmm. magic has two great crises. Uh, but it's the same crisis as everyone the buddha went through these every okay it's mm -hmm. universal crisis the first one is knowing who you are by finally opening up the anahat okay mm -hmm. you be, you you not only wake up uh, in western uh, magic it's called the knowledge and conversation of the holy guardian angel ah oh, okay and uh, i'm doing a whole lecture on it the, you give a wednesday, class about that wednesday night oh wow <laughs> uh, i don't know when this plays but uh, mm -hmm. but anyway it's a zoom thing uh, mm -hmm. the knowledge and conversation of the holy guardian angel is where you finally set up that love feedback. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, and it's seen as a mystic marriage. Mm -hmm. like, like your holy guardian angel is the level of consciousness. It's your own level of consciousness, but it's as long as you're asleep, it seems separated from you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So your angel right now is standing right behind you saying wake up you idiot Kurt. Let, <laughs> let me kiss you you know yeah. <clears throat> uh, because the angel in a sense needs you as much as you need the angel mm -hmm, mm -hmm. but when when you awaken there and that's the first crisis knowledge mm -hmm. and conversation of the holy guardian angel now you know who you are mm -hmm. okay uh, or at least have a good idea of who you are. The next crisis is to cross the abyss, to move through the looking glass. And Why is this a crisis? Because everything you thought you were, mm -hmm. everything you thought mm -hmm. is, everything you thought you had, Mm -hmm. everything every quality you thought there is you have to let go ah oh, okay it, it can't pass through the looking glass mm -hmm. it's too thick <laughs> it's too, <laughs> it's too heavy yeah okay. and it becomes a crisis because whatever little vestiges that you have left whatever little suitcases you've got that aren't really you but you're still hanging on to them mm -hmm. every little piece of baggage that you still have that would separate you from that represents any form of duality whatsoever in your mm -hmm. mind. Mm -hmm. Can't make it through the abyss. Mm -hmm. The only thing that can make it through the abyss is what you really are. Oh, that reminds me to the gates of paradise, which are heavily guarded by, by the cherubim angels. Is this something like that? No, it's it's like that. It's like uh, uh, Cerberus guarding the. Ah, oh, yeah. Oh, and there's all sorts of colorful uh, uh, crossing the abyss uh, imagery, like the the great devil Corona zone. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It means dispersion. The thing is, you can't take what's not you mm -hmm. across the abyss, and even at that high level of consciousness, pretty much everything you think you are isn't you. <laughs> <laughs> Makes sense in a way. 
<laughs> that's that's uh, that's fascinating, uh, but I, I just think, <clears throat> what will the average person think? What is it good for? So when you live a life like you have a job, you have a family, now you are walking that path and you are standing in front of that abyss and think, should I should I go there? So if I would walk over that abyss, if I would go through that crisis, so am I still compatible to a normal life after that? Uh, gee, I would I would say you you would you would have to be, or mm -hmm. you aren't. <laughs> okay. <laughs> the thing is, at each step up that tree of life you sort of master, then balance, and then rebalance mm -hmm. uh, all the little duality things step by step going all the, all the way up, okay? At any one of those points, you can, uh, you, you can falter and, and blow it. But mm -hmm. uh, like, first of all, way down in number 10 on the tree of life consciousness, that's the, what we think of as objective reality. Mm -hmm. And you know, we got to balance, rebalance, conquer our objective reality, even if it's in the most modest terms, we have to keep a roof over our heads, we have to provide for our families and things, mm -hmm. things like that. Going up a little higher, we, we have to uh, uh, keep our uh, reasoning processes and our intellectual processes and our and our education uh, 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 balanced and in tune and we have to conquer that level of consciousness and in numbers say uh, 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 eight we have to uh, you know keep our nervous systems in order number 10 we have to keep our, our seven we'd have to keep our emotional things so at each step of the way the the great work, is doing the the work that our present level of consciousness lays before us mm -hmm. while we still have our eyes set on high yeah at each of those steps we could uh uh try and many of us do uh to to jump a few squares <laughs> <laughs> yeah i know some i know some never worked <laughs> Well, it, it's not that it can't, but it's, it makes things difficult because all of the unbalanced things that uh, uh, you've left undone on your way up bite you in the butt. Okay? Yeah, they do. <clears throat> and when you try to cross the abyss, they really bite you in the butt, okay? Mm -hmm. uh, even to the, to the point of many people uh, will say, you know, I crossed the abyss. Okay, I'm sorry if anyone tells you they've crossed the abyss. I have to. I have to go. Well, if you say so, you know. <laughs> but I have to think. As long as you're thinking in terms of I mm -hmm. as a noun, crossed as a verb, the abyss as another noun. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry, across the abyss, there are no <laughs> nouns <laughs> or I see. verbs. I see. Okay. <laughs> they're, they're all one thing, okay, across the abyss. So. That's, so, that, that's yeah. fascinating. Yeah. And so, uh, magic is, and the, the terminology, uh, magic is attractive to some people. Uh, uh, because it's a, a spiritual art form, mm -hmm. and and all all uh, yogis and all magicians and all mystics are artists, mm -hmm. too. Mm -hmm. and uh, to turn that around, all artists are magicians. Sure, they are. When they get on stage, they make their magic, you know, for thousands of people. Well, not even it, uh, even uh, lonely lonely painters that never meet people at all. If they're artists, mm -hmm. they're magicians. Yeah. Uh, so the, 
but not everybody resonates to mm -hmm. the art form of, of magic. Many of us in the West do. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think we, we might be able to lay the blame on the church or, or with its colorful uh, icons and, and concepts and things like that. Cannibal kind of ritual. Yeah, and our love of ritual and our love of taking all these inner qualities mm -hmm. that in the East, people are just so comfortable. I mean, Eastern mystics are just so comfortable just sitting down, closing their eyes and going in and doing it all in mm -hmm. there. Okay. Mm -hmm. In the West, that just freaks us out. Okay. We, <laughs> we close our eyes and we go, wow, it's too big in there. I think, <laughs> no way. Uh, so, so we like to do things outside of ourselves. We like mm -hmm. rituals and we like playing with uh, inner, inner concepts, but we like playing with them outside of ourselves. Yeah. And not everybody res resonates to that form of magic. And, mm -hmm. and uh, the, the modern sort of Aleister Crowley type, uh, type uh, magic, which is uh, uh, super dramatic, Mm -hmm. and uh, and uh, seemingly sinister, mm -hmm. you know. Believe me, Aleister Crowley is no more sinister than Kali. <laughs> well, well, we come into interesting ground. <laughs> yeah, uh, uh, but the, the 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 idea in the East, these mm -hmm. scary, bloodthirsty looking concepts have always been appreciated as beautiful in art and, and, yes. and, uh, and highest spiritual dimensions represented by this. But the second uh, uh, somebody in uh, Victorian England starts talking oh. that way about the, <laughs> they go, whoa, you know. So is, is this a reason why Crawley's language is so complicated that many, many contents are let's say have not been according to the general societal morals. Uh, yes, uh, he was just about fifty years ahead of his time, mm -hmm, as mm -hmm. as a far as far as the uh, general uh, acceptance mm -hmm. uh, of of many of his so called blasphemies. <laughs> yeah, okay. many. Many of Crowley's blasphemies are pretty much uh, like uh, Episcopalians mm -hmm. <laughs> or the Church of England now. You go, well, uh, yeah, that's his, he's pretty much like that, you know? Uh, well, he was a quite an interesting character. And I, I think that uh, he influenced all the Western esoterics, but they don't like to quote him, but, they, but he did. Yeah. He, he did, and uh, uh, and he was a uh, a human being too. Okay, mm -hmm. and he was a flawed individual, just like just like all of us. But he was such a such a genius and that he more or less felt that everybody was going to understand what he was. <laughs> well, that might have been big mistake to do that. You know? <laughs> Uh, just one question um, came to my mind. Could you explain to, let's say, the normal people, what is an initiation good for? Is this a shortcut or is it, what, what is it? It's not a shortcut. It's a, a recognition, a self-recognition of, uh, of an awakening. Uh, and the awakening uh, doesn't have to be a big dramatic awakening it just has to be a little more awake than you are now mm -hmm. and uh, uh, it, it, it's no more uh, mysterious mysterious than that uh, we go through many initiations in the course of a of a regular normal normal life Mm -hmm. not connected mm -hmm. to mysticism or anything else uh as we grow and, and awaken when you hear an old man say uh, oh if i only knew knew then what i know now 
<laughs> he is a higher initiate. I see. Okay, than he than he was when he didn't didn't know that. Okay, he's a different different person. He's vibrating at a at another level of consciousness. But in the final analysis, there's only one level of consciousness that's conscious, okay? And that's the, that's the singularity. And uh, each of us are just, just monads, mm -hmm. sleeping monads of that consciousness. And as we awaken, we realize that we are a part of a greater and greater body of mm -hmm. awakened consciousness units mm -hmm. until it finally gets to the point where we awaken and realize that, that we've been each other all along. Mm -hmm. And it's that kind of awakening that makes it across the, the abyss and lights the big light bulb, okay? Because mm -hmm. it's only one big light bulb and only one big light. And all the rest are just shades uh, of that consciousness. It's that big light putting on one set of sunglasses after another, after another, after another, after another, <laughs> until finally down here with us, we've got... Uh, welders glasses <laughs> wow yeah they they change the worldview i guess they do um that seems like at each level of this kabbalistic tree of life there is a different set of truths or is it yeah different? Yeah? yeah yeah and uh, uh they, they they try to illustrate that be, uh as the number of the sephira uh uh being the, being the key to the different facets of that level of consciousness mm -hmm. so it's like uh when you're in nine uh it's like you put on glasses that are that are faceted that are cut so that you see everything in terms of nine mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. but every number is infinite it's not like you're you're limited to nine or eight or seven. You're just looking at the one with nine glasses on. Ooh. And that's that's the reality of that awakening process. Mm -hmm. The Kabbalists in anal retentive <laughs> detail <laughs> have all their angel names and their archangel names all being multiples of nine. <laughs> Oh. Okay, and uh, yeah, somebody gives you a box that's got nine sides on it and stuff like that. But when you when you awaken to the world of eight, all of that changes. Mm -hmm. Okay, the, the the truth is looked at. Same truth is looked at at an angle that splits everything into into eight. Mm -hmm. So the truth does not change but the view of the truth changes. I see. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you're a Freemason or not. I'm not, no. Uh, but uh, even in just regular masonry, like my dad mm -hmm. uh, belonged to, uh, they tell you right off, you know, the secrets we're telling you in this degree, uh, uh, they're, uh, they're different than the secrets that you got in the previous degree. <laughs> Okay. Makes sense. Don't forget what you said there. But when you're in this temple, when you're in this degree, this is the truth. And it sometimes contradicts mm -hmm. the, the, the truth of the of the previous degree. That's Kabbalistic crazy thought. Yeah. Yeah. But well, it it's so real, you know. It's uh when you get into different areas of life, then also your truth is changing because you cannot handle life there like you did it here right and that's wow. why uh, uh that's why you see uh, great mystics of the past mm -hmm. usually getting themselves burned at the stake because 
because the truth that they're seeing uh, is upsetting <laughs> everybody else's idea of truth, you know, so. Yeah, no, no good. How, how do you call these people? Crystal Muse? Crystal Muse, yes. Yeah, Crystal Muse. I like that. I like that. <laughs> so it's uh, the worldview of the Christian, Muslims, and Jews. Yeah. yeah. So. <laughs> Crystal Muse. <laughs> Wraps it all up. Wonderful. Lon, do, do you give classes about your wisdom? I mean, you're a, you're a treasure chamber of wisdom. Do, do you give classes? Uh, yes, for 37 years, every Monday wow. night, uh, uh, we uh, gave right up till the pandemic uh, mm -hmm. a class at our home here in Costa Mesa. And uh, it's, uh, it's, it's mostly like this. We just sit around. It's not that I pontificate, you know, class runs itself. Uh, there are brilliant people show up and, and uh, we just, uh, we pretend to have a subject to talk about. So <laughs> we've done that for uh, uh, 37 years. Mm -hmm. uh, but at, uh, since the pandemic, I've been doing Zoom workshops uh, about once a month. And that's what I was talking about this coming Wednesday on the 31st. I'm doing one on the Holy Guardian Angel. Wonderful. I would be happy to uh, give people your contact data and where they get the, the dates uh, from. So just provide me with the information and I will be happy to. Very uh, good. Yeah, I'm on Facebook too. So just look up okay. my name on Facebook and yeah, uh, that's where I live now. <laughs> <laughs> it's an interesting place. Lots of people there. <laughs> yeah. Lon, thank you. This was a wonderful time, really, really fascinating and enchanting time. And uh, I think that many people now will have a better understanding of what life is. Well, if not, I hope they weren't uh, bored. <laughs> no, I don't think <laughs> they will not. So I hope that you get through the pandemic times in a great way and that you and your wife are healthy and thriving. Oh, thank you very much. And same to you. Thank you. Bye-bye, Lon. Bye-bye.